Hey there folks, Rel here. I was recently interviewed by John from Dragon Mind in regards to Distal, my new TTRPG. And that's the interview that you're about to watch. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing awesome and here to talk about my favorite thing, which is TTRPG game design. So uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, Michael is a fellow game master that's appeared previously on Dragon Mind. First, in our playtest panel discussions, when the one D&D Unearthed Arcana was first coming out. Um, and then we also did an episode about a year ago now uh, together on called To Optimize or Not to Optimize, where we discussed various philosophies about TTRPGs and our approaches to it. And since that time, behind the scenes, you've been developing your own TTRPG system called Distal. So uh, for any of our listeners that are unfamiliar with it, can you introduce what Distal is? Sure. Uh, Distal is a high fantasy D20 system based on character stories, conflict, and consequence. It should feel very familiar to folks who have, uh, who have a background in it, playing a D20 system like Dungeons and Dragons or, or Pathfinder, and is built very uh, specifically that way. But the setting is way more grounded. And uh, it gets rid of some of the uh, some of the bugbears that I have with um, with other systems, which I'm sure we'll talk about. So before we move on, can you uh, just let our listeners know where the name Distal comes from? Uh, it comes from a desperate search to find a suitable name for a TTRPG. Actually, before it was Distal, it was uh, the working name was Keystone uh, because there are these monolithic keystones on the uh, in the world and uh, the the plane that you're on is uh, I refer to it now as the as the distal plane but distal kind of just means like furthest from uh, center which is it's just a little bit of framing for potentially what the world could could hold but realistically I think it's just a cool name sometimes that's all you need is a cool name um yeah. So uh, I do know that you have some experience in the video game industry. And like you've mentioned on your YouTube channel, um, the TTRPG realm, it's, a, a, I'm guessing, a very different industry. Um, so what made you want to develop your own TTRPG? Uh, so I enjoy creating all sorts of stuff. I mean, game design is a passion of mine, and I, I can't help but to be just uh, knee deep wading through all of the the fun design challenges and uh, just the actual creation process. I'm very much a kind of a generalist or a jack of all trades when it comes to my capabilities in uh, using various or various software and uh, and building out systems and, and that sort of thing. So I kind of like to do everything myself. So when thinking about a new project, I, I was originally working on a just an indie game, something that I wanted to make uh, for fun for myself when I, uh, I don't want to say left the games industry, but when I left the past uh, job or my past uh, position in the games industry, I started making something for myself. And then I uh, kind of got distracted with the uh, with building a, a TTRPG. It was mostly just meant to be a fun thing, uh, like a creative release valve on the side. And then I started shifting more and more focus uh, that direction. A lot of it is because there was definitely some instant gratification involved when you can just put words on paper and then see the immediate change in you know, how the game is played. Uh, and that kind of had a, a really strong appeal for me. So yeah, it was a distraction. Now it's, it's kind of a focus. What can you do? Yeah, well, I can definitely relate. Um, if you had asked me what I wanted to be when I was like 19 or 20 years old, I probably would have said a video game designer. Um, one thing that drew me away from video game design was a lot of the professors at the university I was attending were just talking about like the physical health concerns. <laughs> so like, you know, pulling all nighters, uh, you know, you don't have the healthiest diet. Um, it just didn't seem very appealing to the kind of life I wanted to live. And later on, I found that even TTRPG homebrew was much more instantly gratifying, like you said, because you could come up with a rule on the spot 
it's kind of an expectation of the game environment and you could see how it plays out and what its balance is kind of in real time. So you could make a decision like maybe that gets you a plus two modifier and instantly you can see if that's just right or a little too a little too little or a little too much. Um, now you mentioned that there are some like challenges that you like to challenge yourselves. Is there something about TTRPG design that you find more challenging than the video game industry? Uh, you know, I think the biggest one is actually the uh, the social layer that lives on top of the actual game. Because when you're you're building a game, um, so previously I worked on Planet Side 2. I was there for seven years, um, really just making uh, amazing things. It's a very long-lived game with a large community. And uh, in the game is a it's a free-to-play, massively multiplayer um, uh, first-person shooter. So you you definitely had a layer of uh, kind of like social experience on top. It uh, the game kind of relied on its players, and because of that, uh, it also had to cater in some degree to the uh, to the play styles of those players and kind of the opinions which would change um, of those players as well. But I, I still think that it is super distant from uh, something like a TTRPG, where it's not just random you know faces on the on the internet in this virtual space it's people at your table that you likely have real life relationships with and because of that uh learning to set expectations for for the game is uh well and you know create an experience that is challenging rewarding fun not deflating if things don't go the, the right direction is something that uh, it's I think is very difficult to to design uh, around, and some of the some of the best examples of of games that do this really well I think are the ones that set uh, very specific expectations up front. So Shadow Dark is a good example of like yeah I know it's old school you're you can die randomly uh, you know just like turn a corner and then you run into the wrong thing. Um, so learning how to set those expectations while also targeting the same, uh, the, the feel in the market that I wanted to cater to, which is very much uh, modern D&D players. It's, I think that is a challenge in itself, finding a way to stand out. Absolutely. Um, a personal pet peeve of mine, actually, like speaking to that social layer, is when I'm on Reddit or, you know, giant in the playground or something, and I see somebody post their homebrew, and the way they say it is, players will be incentivized to X, Y, Z, or will not be incentivized. And in a video game, it's a little more predictable because there's a code and a program. And as open as a game you can try to create, like Witcher or Baldur's Gate 3, there really is only a limited number of outcomes you can really get. Whereas with a social game, like a TTRPG, it's only limited by the social contract at the table. Um, so it, it is really interesting. Like as soon as I see that kind of thing, it's like a red flag for me where it's like, you, you haven't played with a whole lot of different players, have you? Cause they will always, always surprise you. Um, now you mentioned that this is a D20 system and that it's close to fifth edition D and D just curious. Uh, you mentioned that you're trying to capture the modern D and D player. What do you see as some traits of a modern player, quote unquote, versus like an old school player? What are like the differences? So I think I, this is still a topic that I'm exploring for myself. But based on, I, I think that we're kind of in a, uh, a culture at the moment that is very much persuaded by, you know, critical role and just mainstream uh, Dungeons and Dragons play. And because of that, there's a certain expectation that's kind of set at the table. At the same time, I think that enough time has passed to where we are getting, I think a little bit more, we're, we're branching out a little bit more. The people who came in to uh, you know five e five years ago are probably not the same sorts of players or not the same people that they were, you know, during that that time. It's because they've played a lot. Uh, the community's own expectations have kind of uh, shifted as well. You see, games like uh, MCDM's uh, new uh, upcoming RPG, you know, raised over $4 million on, on backer kit, which is absolutely bananas. Um, and, and it's trying to hit a lot of uh, uh, similar beats to uh, fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons, which was 
panned at the time because it was a little bit before its time. So it's to me, it's kind of uh, you can see uh, you kind of see how a uh, community evolves to where now, you know, now might be the right time. Like if Dungeons and Dragons just decided to re-release fourth edition, I kind of wonder if the reception would be different. Uh, not just due to the, I, I remember that there was some talk about no, Dungeons and Dragons fourth edition is probably best suited for a virtual tabletop, which wasn't very popular uh, around that, that time period. Um, actually, did it even exist? Like, I can't even remember. Yeah, there was a promise of one. It was kind of designed for a VTT, but they released it before the VTT. And I do think it was just kind of before its time. I, I do know another criticism is just kind of an identity thing. So you can take fourth edition, not label it Dungeons and Dragons. And there's a lot of speculation that it might have been successful had it not been attached to that brand name. But because people had a certain idea of how D&D worked and it was such a harsh shift away from that, um, that was part of the reason why it wasn't as successful. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, I think that, you know, so M MCDMs, RPG is kind of in a similar position where they're, you know, they're their own thing. They have a proven track record of, of products that are, you know, uh, popular and successful and have good design instinct. And now they, they, can, they can create something for this audience that is kind of starting to move past fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. So I feel like now is kind of a, an opportune time to explore new avenues. And I'm not sure where the current D&D player is likely to head, but I do know that uh, a lot of the folks who are trying to, to play uh, Distal and kind of giving feedback on it and that sort of thing are, for one, super excited because it, it's, it's, not close, it's not close enough to D&D for it to feel like it's, you know, some sort of derivative, it's very much its own thing. At the same time, it feels very familiar, and it scratches an itch that uh, players, I think, are ready to start um, entertaining again. Yeah, one thing uh, our mutual friend Stephanie from the Stephanie Ann podcast has said is that it's okay for Dungeons and Dragons to exist as kind of like a starter game. It's the first game you get into to become familiar with the hobby, but it's also okay to branch out from there into more specific niches that will like scratch certain itches, kind of like you were saying. Um, now, speaking about Dungeons and Dragons, um, you've mentioned multiple times that you love fifth edition in particular. And the first time I had you on, I was talking more from like a touchy feely place. Like, what do you like about D and D? But from a more nuts and bolts game design perspective, um, what is it about 5th edition or what are some specific design choices of 5th edition that you didn't want to deviate completely away from it? So using the D20 in general, I feel very strongly about it. It's just a fun die to roll. You know, the natural one, the natural 20 have a certain feel to them. And I'm sure that's not for every person, but, uh, but there's definitely something that you can kind of understand and connect with there. It's also, despite it being very swingy, uh, I think that there are ways to, to kind of help alleviate some of those uh, concerns and balance the game, uh, maybe a little bit more. I don't know if I'm doing it right, but we'll we'll figure that out pretty soon. Actually, you know, there's there's I think there's more than I I wanted to get rid of from Dungeons and Dragons that I than I wanted to keep, which is not necessarily a, a bad thing. I'm not viewing it that way. I'm saying that. Uh, the, the way that certain mechanics work, like proficiency bonuses, how they level with you, is something that I don't necessarily want in, in my experience. I don't want the player to just constantly be growing uh, in spite of, of what they're doing. Um, I mean, they, they will a little bit, but the, the power curve is way less drastic is uh, than Dungeons & Dragons. And because of that, it, or because of Dungeons and Dragons existence and its current structure, it gave me a lot of uh, guidelines for things that I I want to try to tweak and uh, make my own without doing like without just uh, changing something for the sake of changing something. It's really fun to analyze the design decisions and the the history kind of behind certain mechanics so that you can have a better informed opinion when it comes to creating your own. Yeah, 
you released a video on your YouTube channel called In Defense of the Attack Roll, which was a response to a lot of these systems, like you mentioned, the MCDM RPG, uh, Dagger Heart from Critical Role also is getting rid of the D20. Um, and one of the points you brought up that I thought was really important is there's a certain culture around the natural 20 or the natural one. Um, and it also makes it a little more marketable. So we don't walk around, you know, wearing t-shirts that are like 2D12 on a special curve. Like it, it's not as transferable, I think, culturally as just saying like natural 20, natural one. There's a certain like John A. Cuff like soundtrack that comes with that, uh, those phrases. Now you've already mentioned some things like uh, proficiency bonus with level. I completely agree. I, I much prefer kind of the Pathfinder method of different things having different levels of proficiency which distal also includes a, a version of that not as not as crunchy as pathfinder but a version of it um are there other things about fifth edition's design that you found dissatisfying the i think the biggest one is just the yo-yo healing uh that drives me absolutely nuts it's so counterintuitive to the the goals of a living creature in the game that they would prefer to be knocked on the ground and picked back up rather than avoid having that happen at all. And for, for distal, I try to punish you is, is kind of a strong word, but certainly disincentivize you from going down in the first place. And a lot of the mechanics center around uh, mitigating damage before it becomes a problem. So there's some uh, armor mechanics, uh, you, you buffer, uh, incoming damage with by rolling a, a counter rolling a die uh and actually Daggerheart is doing this too so in some respect it's like okay that that idea wasn't way out there you know that's that's probably one of the biggest ones and then i have this uh feeling when it comes to the long rest and the short rest that our pacing is kind of wrong in dungeons and dragons and it certainly wasn't even originally meant to be how most tables play in the modern sense I, I think that there's maybe at most one to two combats in a, a modern session of D&D. And then you, you know, get to sleep and your health goes back to full. Uh, I don't know. It just doesn't sit right with me. And I think that it leans into the fact that the, uh, the game is more about empowering the players and being sort of a power fantasy than it is the actual life of an adventurer. And uh, so that's one of the elements that you see kind of uh, see me get away from in distal as well so speaking about things that are distal specific uh, and you've mentioned before that one of your goals is to stand apart from the competition what are some unique game mechanics that you've developed besides like the armor buffering uh that kind of sets distal apart from 5e or pathfinder so when you create your character you you can immediately see that the game is different we focus uh so you'll you'll pick up your uh, your lineage, which is, you know, race, species, whatever. And then you uh, write a background. And unlike backgrounds in uh, in many games, you know, DC20, D&D, &D, uh, Pathfinder, they're, they're all kind of like static. This is where you've been or like uh, kind of where you come from. And here's some token things that you get. And then that, that kind of leaves the player to, if they really want to invest in the, the, the role play side of the game, they have to still come up with something totally new and on their their own. And, and I feel like a lot of us are limited by cliches and our uh, lack of imagination. So in, in Distal, you write a background through prompts. And it's a little bit of a life path sort of uh, mechanic, but it's, I think, more lightweight than a lot of the ones that you'd see. So just as an example, one of the prompts is, I grew up... And then there's uh, a list of uh, prompts that you roll on. And then each of these sort of like Mad Libs fill in the blank options will give you mechanical benefits that kind of accent your character. And you do this a number of times until the character is uh, built out. It doesn't take a lot of time to complete, but it does uh, give you a frame of reference for what your character could have done prior to their uh, them becoming an adventurer. Uh, it's a super fun mechanic. The, the feedback is really good. Anybody who who's played with it um, seems to to enjoy it. Uh, the other mechanic that I, I really would like to see the outcome 
of over a long course of play are death marks. So when you, this is, uh, we talked earlier about kind of the yo-yo healing and that sort of thing. And uh, in this game, if you get knocked down, you gain a death mark. And then if you stay down uh, each round, you'll gain another death mark. This is a finite amount of uh, finite amount of times you can be placed within the dying condition before you are dead forever. And in that in itself is structuring the game in such a way that says like, oh, okay, well, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to fall over. And uh, so it changes the way that the game is played. It changes some of the outlook that the character will have uh, as they accumulate more death marks. There's also some positives too, where you can pick up some specialties, which are just feats in 5e, uh, but they require you to have a certain amount of death marks. So there are um, little gameplay implications uh, from this, this system as well. And uh, I think at the end of the day, an adventurer could end up in a situation where they just end up retiring that character and it will be totally okay for them to do that. Totally makes sense for the story as you've seen so much death and hardship and you're just worn down. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe like Frodo at the end of the rings where he's just like, he's just broken by the end of it and he has to go live a different life. He can't go back to the old one. That's the, that's the sort of evolution of a character that I could see in playing this game. And I don't know that a game like Dungeons and Dragons is going to be able to achieve it unless you're focusing very heavily on the roleplay side and just making stuff up. Yeah, there's definitely not a mechanical representation of that kind of thing. Um, D&D in particular, actually, um, there was one one content creator that said it's it's not really a role playing game. It's like a a fanfic original creator a character generator kind of game where you're just creating fan art and just trying to create some fan fiction that way, which in a way isn't that all kind of TTRPGs. But um, but no, like death marks definitely do change your relationship with combat and change your relationship with how you look through your character's eyes in determining what you want them to do in different situations. Um, to go back for a second to your background generation system, um, I don't think you're, I think you're downplaying a little how fun it is. Like it is, I have played many life path systems like that, and I have not played one as well designed and as engaging as the one you created for Distal. Um, Aww, thank a lot, you. Yeah, I, a lot of times, and this could have just been the kind of the time period, um, other life path systems, I feel like, were too specific and focused on the wrong things. So, for example, I remember one where it was like, you know, what was your family's income? And that was fine. But then it's like, exactly how many siblings did you have? And it was just as likely that you had nine siblings as you had one. So you literally rolled a D10 and that was the siblings. And then you'd have to figure out what age each of the siblings was and, you know, what gender they were and all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was this a lot of time was spent on these weird specific things, whereas distal strikes that golden balance where the prompt gives you a twist to the character that personally having played a lot of D and D I would have never thought of. Um, but it's not so specific or closed off or narrow that you can't add your own creative spin to it. Um, and so I see it not only as a distal story generator but you know once your product is released like i can see any um interested no matter what system you're running um people being able to pick up that system and integrate it into whatever their own ttrpg is so you did mention that um there are classes in distal it is a class heavy game the classes also do i feel like flavor wise tend to be more specific than what you find in dungeons and dragons for example, um, the kind of uh, equivalent to a rogue is called a cutthroat, which feels very different even in the title than like just a generic rogue who could be a swashbuckler or thief. Um, what made you want to create a class heavy game and create these more specific class types? I, 
you know, I think this kind of harkens back to um, some of the just D and D. They're they're not issues. Everything is fine, but uh, I I like it when a class is more grounded in the actual setting. And unfortunately, D and D doesn't really have um, a default setting outside of um, you know Forgotten Realms, which even then you, it's arguable whether or not that's a that's a default setting. So because of that, their design has to be a little bit more um, broadly appealing and, and generic. And I have the freedom to to create something that is kind of hyper specific to the the setting. So when you're looking at you know the ferryman class, which deals a lot in in death and they've already seen death and kind of been on the other side and then come back, that's because of how death works in this game. Um, and the the reason for being is very much uh, focused on that. I, I think that creating something that is more specific, but also having a lot of avenues to to play it, is something that I'm a big fan of. I really liked multiclassing in Dungeons and Dragons, but I think that's also because I was, um, in some part, trying to. I mean, optimize isn't even the strongest word. Uh, you've seen me play. I don't. I'm not a huge uh, fan of of that. But um, but create something interesting, and I think that maybe uh, some of my desire to create very unique uh, classes stems from that uh, the desire to get away from something that feels generic. Yeah, Distal definitely is a more specific setting, and I really like that about it. Um, the it definitely doesn't feel like I could just bring any character and make it in the Distal system and i i do think that's a good thing i i wonder how much of my um my D D experience was kind of colored by the fact that i wanted to like take karama from yu yu Hakusho and see if i could make that in the D D system and largely i've been successful at doing that a lot but also there wasn't a robust tool set like with distal that allowed me to situate the character in a specific world with some of the source books there were, that's one of the reasons why my favorite fifth edition book is uh, Eberron Rising from the Last War. There, there's a lot in that book to help guide your players in getting situated in the specific setting. But I do find that as a weakness of D&D overall is that they don't really offer a lot of tools for dungeon masters to be able to hook players in in that same way. It's It's kind of just like make something and show up and We'll try to scrounge it together. This might be similar to a question that I've already asked, but uh, I'll ask it anyway. Um, is there a particular element of distal that you're most excited about? There's so much that is, there's so much that's different that I, I really want to get more more folks into to play the game and be able to to get the, you know, the feedback and that sort of thing. Um, the last alpha release changed so so much about the game. That there's a there's definitely a bunch of mechanics that I want to try, and need need feedback on. First of which is just like uh, the way that we handle ammunition. You can you can kind of hand wave ammunition. A lot of tables do it. You know you're not counting arrows or anything, or you have an expectation that uh, you know, the the leg loss of the group is going to be either recovering arrows between fights or you know crafting more or whatever. And uh, but in in D and D proper, you know there's yeah you have twenty arrows and then you have to count them down. And keep track of that and neither of those methods felt quite good enough to to me because they're either like super annoying or or they don't matter um so one way that i kind of wanted to bridge the gap is by using a dice chain on on ammunition so every time that you make an attack of the bow you're going to roll a d12 and if that d12 ever ends up on a one then the die is going to degrade by a size and then go down to you know a d10 and that's so it's an abstract representation of ammo. And then if you ever roll a one on a D4, you're just out. And so it's it's like really lightweight um ammo management that is kind of like you roll it once, you forget about it. You know, you're not ticking little boxes or anything like that. So I I I'm only excited to try that from the perspective of I've never done it before. And it seems like an interesting mechanic. Um, the stuff that is more established though, the stuff that I'm excited about as far as mechanics. For distal that are kind of um, that have proven themselves out, or definitely the character creation. I think that's uh, that's great. I think it'll add a lot of value to uh, to the existing TTRPG space for the reasons that you talked about. How you know it, you just aren't really getting it from other life paths, 
either being too specific or too generic. I I really want to watch characters kind of evolve over time with, with uh, death marks and just the, the actual evolution of the characters themselves. Uh, I want to see how well, I guess, the more compressed nature of health pools in this game work. So you only gain a health bump every four levels uh, in, in distal, and it goes up to, to level 12. So you are you're not like intentionally not as strong as a Dungeons and Dragons character that is going to become a demigod here within a you know a handful of levels. It is meant to keep you uh, there's there's definitely some progression. So it kind of keeps you interested, your character keeps evolving. And at the same time, uh, you are eventually going to fight monsters that are way out of your league and you'll have to figure out how to navigate those situations. Um, there's a mechanic that I just added in the game. It's very, it's definitely very optional. And I don't know if you've read this yet, uh, John, but there are, so a lot of the monsters are structured very similarly to, um, to 4E where they all have different roles and that sort of thing. Uh, just to kind of like tell you how they're meant to be used um, in the game. And they're also structured for different tiers of play. So uh, characters levels one through three, so as an example, are going to fight monsters in this bracket and then that sort of thing. And you don't need to do that. You can always you know, pick a, a higher level monster and, and bring them down uh, to fight your lower level players you know, if, if you want to give them more of a challenge. But there are there is one specific monster in the game currently um, that is a representation of a new mechanic that kind of harkens back to old school D and D, and that's um, I added a, a basilisk who can very much petrify you, and you're just done. And it is the monster itself is tagged with uh, the keyword like dooming, because a, a dooming monster is very much intentionally meant to give your party an unrivaled challenge that could totally jack up their day. This is the bridge that I have for old school players who wish that they had some sort of challenge that they need to prepare for, that they need to learn about, that they need to figure out how to overcome instead of just like, okay, we're going to have two encounters this session and then boop, 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 you're going to triumph, whatever. Uh, so a, a GM does not need to use these monsters. It is just an option if their table really wants to uh, try something that's that has an old school feel to it. So, um, this is not a question I sent you before, but it just came up and I'm, I'm really curious what you'd have to say on it. So call of Cthulhu as a system, I have been told has all of these tools in order to flesh out your character and really get in their headspace. And it, like you said, this is grounded, not gritty. Whereas Call of Cthulhu is definitely gritty, like there's a lot of bad stuff that can happen. And one of the expectations going in is that your character can die at any time. Like they could meet an Eldritch Horror really early in the game and just get zapped. So one of the feedbacks I've heard, um, Brennan Lee Mulligan in particular brought this up, is that you take all this time to develop a character and they could be harmed or gone very quickly without a lot of notice um and because of that one of the things he noticed is a lot of players that go into call of cthulhu end up not investing in their character they don't the consequences they don't feel matter because they know my character can die at any time um so i do agree that fifth edition is way too far on the other end where there are way too many ways to save your character i mean i texted you the other day playing my first run of Baldur's Gate 3 on tactical mode and or tactician difficulty levels one through three. Like I was like every fight, I'm like, I, there's nothing I can do. <laughs> but once I hit level five, like I, spoiler alert, literally fought the avatar of the God of death and didn't have anyone take any damage. And it was like, it, it, it was so clear where that threshold was very specifically level five, where, I, go, I went from I can't survive to I'm invincible. So D&D is too far on the other end. How do you reconcile that for players that are nervous about losing their character? And so either they need to feel safe, like their characters need to be able to not die in order to emotionally invest and get something meaningful out of the game versus 
players that if they know their character can die, they 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 immediately don't invest and get as much out of it. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, I think systems that have a have a quick death usually also have a quick character creation process just so, you, so that you can kind of throw something together and, uh, you know, because it might die. Um, I haven't played Call of Cthulhu, so I really can't speak to it. But I, I feel like the way that you reconcile some of this is by creating, so setting some baseline expectations and then clear messaging when it comes to things that could cause problems. And so, for example, um, level one in Distal, uh, you have twice your health pool, um, twice the health pool maximum. And that's specifically because uh, it helps offset some of that penalty of you know, dying very quickly in Dungeons and Dragons because a monster has, or because the GM accidentally used a monster that they probably shouldn't have used. You know, maybe a first time GM, they have a monster with multi attack and then it just kind of wrecks a party. So we we create uh, very intentionally um, the monsters that are meant to fight these characters at certain levels. There's even tutorial monsters in the game for um, that are just really easy to you know a little confidence booster. So I, I think that a lot of it comes from from messaging, and then you leave in options to escalate difficulty, and that is something either that the the GM should be able to feel out. Uh, just for example, the basilisk that I'm talking about, it has a tag called dooming. There's a whole section that says like, Hey, these monsters are explicitly meant to jack up your day. It could end a character's story. Uh, use them only when it feels appropriate to the table. And if they're on board with it, uh, so it's not like something that you normally run into. And I think that that's a pretty good compromise to, you know, you learn what your table is kind of all about. Um, you might even throw in that monster when it's the the character's time to end their story. Uh, the death mark system in general, um, just to, to kind of go back to it, is so to compare to Dungeons and Dragons 5e, you get knocked down, and despite having said that it is very easy to pick you back up, kind of you know yo-yo heal, it's also you can enter situations where you can just die without actually being able to respond to it. So for example, you get knocked over. The rest of the team is a little bit too far away. And then there's more than one monster next to you. If that's the case, the monster hits you. It's an automatic crit. There's two death saves. If there's another monster, it'll you know, instantly kill you. And then you're just done. It could have just been a random encounter. You could have just walked down an alleyway. And then, then that's it. Um, whatever you've invested in your character it doesn't matter anymore. Um, especially at those low levels where you can't resurrect. Also, resurrect, totally different topic. Um, which trivializes, you know, in the other direction, the death at, at higher levels. So when using death marks, just as an example, uh, it's not, it's not like, okay, you fell down, you're going to get stabbed a bunch of times, and then you're dead. It's you fell down. This is going to leave a lasting mark. You're probably going to be okay. If you the rest of your party can clean up the rest of the, the fight, uh, you'll just kind of have that permanent scar, which will hopefully inform some of the, the outlook and the decisions that you make next time it can kind of give you momentum into the character uh or like into role playing that character kind of as you move forward versus like okay hard stop on the story i know you you tried so it's it's a little bit more um forgiving in that respect yeah i think another big part of it which you mentioned earlier too was in that regard the tiered healing um or sorry the tiered health pool uh, that was one of the things I got most excited about when you messaged us before we did the distal play test, which is on your YouTube channel. It is really funny how like level one D and D play, I find much more challenging again than level five D and D play. Um, and I think that the tiered health is a great way of showing how there, there is a progression of power, but not so drastic that you kind of get to a point where you really don't have to think <laughs> as you play the game, which I've always thought should be the opposite. As you get higher in level, you should have more choices and more things to try out, not less choices because one thing gets so much better than everything else. So you've also kind of mentioned this already with the modern D&D &D players. That's kind of who you're designing this for. 
Are there specific personalities that you see enjoying this system? I think that anybody who has kind of played D&D long enough and is looking for an additional challenge, I guess, or something that's a little bit more grounded, something that you have to kind of consider your character more. You know, I have, what, more than 50 Dungeons & Dragons characters just like chilling in D&D Beyond that I will never play. And I think that a lot of people are in those uh, sorts of situations you know, where they have a really cool character concept um, and they have a lot of cool character concepts because there's so many things that you can you can do in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but I, I wonder if placing more emphasis on the things you can do as the character evolves, uh, just even from the from the narrative perspective, maybe that's the person who's who's really going to enjoy this game. Somebody who's played D and D long enough, and they they kind of know the ins and outs, and they're there. They've kind of exhausted some of the mechanical uh, elements. Maybe people who are looking for, I mean, even just something new in that respect. And at the same time, um, still want to feel comfortable with the D20 system. All right. So um, in our post-OGL environment, there are a lot of people, like we mentioned earlier, with Critical Role and MCDM and dozens, if not thousands of smaller creators uh, that are interested in creating their own TTRPG, whether it's a system or just releasing homebrew content or maybe even just lore and world information. Um, what advice would you give anyone who's interested in developing their own TTRPG? So the same advice that anybody who's been in the games industry gives somebody who wants to be in the games industry, which is start small. Um, basically, don't do what I did. I this is very much do as I say, not as I do. But you can get by creating small systems. Uh, the first thing that you create doesn't need to be your dream game. Also, like I guess, do something that you are capable of doing. So we all have different skill sets. Um, if you are really good at writing, but not so great at the at the art side, or even um, maybe even like the design side, you could probably do a system that is more kind of lightweight and focused on narrative uh, instead of you know, something that's really mechanics heavy. And then just realize that the more mechanics that you create, the more invested a player has to become. So is your goal to, to have a bunch of people play it? Because if they are, uh, building a system like the one that I'm building is not a good idea. Do something that's rules light. Rules light is also like weirdly in vogue right now. Um, where a lot of people are talking about kind of moving to that. And I think it is in part because of uh, just we've invested so much time and energy into Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons, which are rules heavy and have also grown up. So we have less time. Uh, that, that would be my, my main advice is definitely do as I say, not as I do. But hopefully if you're making something new, uh, that'll get you going. So last question for today. Um... This still comes out. People get their hands on it. What is it that you'd hope people will say about the system? I hope to eventually get into the place where everybody's complaining about how overpowered one class is uh, or one ability is. I would love to be there, honestly. Um, but that requires you know a bunch of people to, to play it, enjoy it, understand it. Uh, in lieu of that, maybe I would really like them to say, oh, this is... I can take some of these ideas into you know, my homebrew or or just a different system that I'm playing. I just I hope that there are foundational ideas here that can help others. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, if somebody wants to get in contact with you or download the latest alpha playtest of Distal, where can people find you? If you go to playdisrpg.com, you can pick up the alpha core rules totally for free. And you can message me on Twitter at RELPLAYS.